Sorry, I did yeah. not have a chance to um, actually modify whatever's on the book down because it would have required a lot. Um, the way it, it, it has, it has, has some of the theory and then labs sort of like stuck in there, which is fine, you know, some people prefer that. Um, but I like to sort of keep like the book chapter separate from the, the lab material. So um, I'm just gonna go through the these slides. Um, it's 50 slides, but it should go fairly quickly. And then uh, you guys just stop me then uh, if there's questions or, or anything, if, if that's good. Yes. Okay. For me. So um, this chapter is on unsupervised learning. And so I think the major distinction that one should be aware of is that, uh, you know, most of the stuff that we've looked through so far is supervised learning methods, right? Like regression and classification. And so in that case, we have features, right? As well as a response or outcome variable, Y, right? And we're generally trying to predict Y using the features. So here, instead we have um, only the features and we're not interested in predictions because we don't have an associated response variable. Okay, so the goal is then just to discover interesting things about the measurements, right? Is there like an informative way to visualize the data? Can we discover subgroups among the variables, right? And so we are gonna discuss two methods, principal component analysis, right? So it's uh, essentially for visualization or pre-processing before any supervised techniques are applied. And then also clustering, which is um, a class of methods for discovering like unknown subgroups in the, in the feature space. Okay, so the challenge of unsupervised learning is that it's more subjective. Um, because uh, there is no simple goal for the analysis, like a prediction of a response, right? Um, but techniques for unsupervised learning are growing in importance in a number of fields. So for example, like a lot of gene expression uh, studies use these types of like unsupervised learning techniques. So here they're giving um, an example of subgroups of breast cancer patients, right? And you're grouping by gene expression. Or for example, like groups of shoppers that are characterized by their browsing and purchase histories, right? Or movies grouped by ratings that are assigned by movie viewers and uh, are used, for example, in like recommender systems like Netflix. Okay, so another advantage is that it's often easier to, wait, how did that just skip? Okay, anyway. Okay, so an advantage is that it is easier to obtain unlabeled data, right? From a lab instrument or a computer than labeled data which oftentimes requires, you know, a human in order to put the labels in. So um, it is difficult, for example, to automatically assess the overall sentiment of a movie review, like is it favorable or not? Um, okay, so now getting into PCA. So PCA produces a low dimensional representation of a data set, right? So it finds a sequence of linear combinations of the variables that have maximal variance and are also mutually uncorrelated. And so apart from producing derived variables for use in supervised learning problems, um, PCA is also really great for data visualization. So essentially in this method, you are trying to reduce the number of features, so reduce the dimensions, but keep as much information as possible within, you know, like these new sets of the coordinates, which are the principal components. Okay, so in detail, um, so the first principal component, right, of the set of our features x1 through xp is just a normalized linear combination of those features, right? So z is the first principal component, and then you have these five um, linear combinations of all of your features. And it's the combination that has the largest variance. And then by normalized, it's meant that uh, this phi squared is constrained to be equal to one. So the sum of overall these uh, phi squared values, right? So these phi squared elements are referred to as the loadings of the first principal component. And all of them together, right, make the first principal component loading vector, okay? So again, the loadings are constrained so that their sum of squares is equal to one, right? Since otherwise setting these elements to be arbitrarily large in their absolute value could just result in a, this huge uh, variance. Uh, okay, so here's an example of a PCA. So this is from a previous chapter. Um, so this is only two features, population and ad spending, right? 
and for a hundred different cities. These are the little purple dots. And then this green solid line indicates the first principal component direction, which is the direction of most variants. And this blue dashed line, which is orthogonal or uncorrelated, is the second principal component direction. Okay, so computation of principal components. So they don't actually get into the details of the method, but I think that this might be sufficient, even though I'm not entirely sure that I get it down to the very last of the details, but we'll just go over it. So say that we have an N by P data set X, right? So since we are only looking or are interested in the variance, we're just gonna assume that each of the variables in X has been centered. So the mean is equal to zero, right? So the column means or equal to zero. And then we're looking for a linear combination of the sample feature values in this form, right? So these are all the linear combinations of the predictors. So for I equals one through N number of observations that has the largest sample variance. And again, subject to this constraint so that, you know, we don't have like these like ridiculously large variances. Um, since each of the xijs has a mean zero right here, so then so does zi1 for any value of this phi um, variable, right? So the sample variance then of this in one can be written as this is just the average of the squared uh, values for this zi1. Yeah, that's the variance. Okay, so um, so plugging in one, so this um, solves this optimization problem. So essentially, you're looking to maximize the variance subject to this constraint, right? The variance is this is going to be one. Um, and then, okay, so this is where they actually don't go into a lot of detail, but. Um, the problem can be solved via singular value decomposition of the matrix, which is a standard technique in linear algebra. So I've never done linear algebra, but you both have, so you probably would understand. I think it's also done via, um, I think it's called like eigenvalue decomposition, where you look at like variance covariance matrices. And I think that solving for those gives you the loadings, but um, I, f I forget sort of the details. Okay, so then Z1, is the first principal component with realized values. And these are just the, the Z scores. Um, okay, so now uh, geometry of PCA. So the loading vector phi one with all of these elements, right? Defines a direction in the feature space along which the data vary the most. So the direction of most variance, right? And then if you project the end data points, like it's one through XN onto that first uh, principal component, um, the projected values are the principal component scores themselves for uh, the data points. So, okay, so then now that we have the first one, we can also uh, get further principal components. So the second principal component is again, the linear combination. So again, very similar, except that now it's uncorrelated with that first principal component, right? And so this is also given uh, as ZI2, and this is the linear combination. Um, right, where phi two is just the second principal component loading vector with these elements. All right. Um, so it turns out that as we, well, I just said, constraining Z to be uncorrelated with uh, Z one is equivalent to constraining the direction um, phi two to be orthogonal or perpendicular to the direction of phi one and so on. So, these principal component directions, uh, phi one through p, are the ordered sequence of right singular vectors of the matrix X, and the variances of the components are one over n times the square of the singular values. Okay, so yeah, so I think that was given in a previous equation, and there are most uh, minimum of n minus one p principal components. Okay, so let's uh, go on to an illustration of this. So using the USA arrests data. So for each of the 50 states in the United States, the data set contains a number of arrests per 100,000 residents. And so it's for crimes like assault, murder, and rape. And then there's also um, 
a feature that is describing the percent of people that lives in urban areas, right? So uh, the principal component score vectors have the length n equals 50 for the states, and then the principal component loading vectors are p equals four for each of the types of crimes, right? So, and urban population. So then uh, they perform PCA after standard standardizing each variable to have a mean of zero and standard deviation one. And here are the results. So I guess on, along this first principal component um, axis, right, is where you see, um, okay, I guess so. So the loadings here, right, um, show you that these three, rape, assault, and murder, are more correlated and also correlate in this direction of the first PC, but urban population is not as much. That That is different and it's also um, sort of like, not pointing away, but in, in a different direction than these three. And then you can see like uh, states that have, you know, higher rape, assault or murder um, sort of alongside uh, where the loadings are, are pointing to. So, um, Never since, yeah. Uh, okay, so this is essentially, you know, what this figure summarizes, and uh, the figure is known as a biplot because it displays both the principal component scores and the principal component loadings. Okay, so these are the the loadings, and okay, so here we have another interpretation of principal components, right? So you can also think of this as the Let's see what it said. So the first principal component loading vector um, defines a line in p-dimensional space that is closest to the n observations, right? And this is using the average squared Euclidean distance as a measure of closeness, right? And this notion that the principal components as the dimensions that are closest to the n observations also extends beyond just the first principal component. So for instance, the first two principal components of a data set span the plane that is closest to the n observations in terms of the average Euclidean distance. Um, so this I had not heard before. So generally um, in what I've used PCA for, which is uh, studies of like gene expression, um, it's always, you know, the, uh, defined as a direction that gives you the the largest variance, right? But I think that is also very interesting and kind of intuitive to think about it in this way, right? As the hyperplane that is closest to most of the points or all the points. And so therefore it gives you a good description of what is contained in, in the data, right? Um, okay. So here they're just showing why scaling the variables matters, right? So for example, if the variables are in different units, you have to um, scale each of them to have a standard deviation that is equal to one so that everything is contributes essentially equally. And you know, just because you have larger units of measure or whatever is not driving the results of the PCA. Um, so for example, um, on the left-hand side, we have the scaled, uh, variables. And again, you see this nice relationship between rape, assault, and murder, and uh, seeing that urban population is not as correlated with these. But if you unscale, then you sort of lose this relationship. Now, rape and murder here are kind of central, and then it looks like assault is driving most of the, the variance in, in this uh, pr first principal component. Um, and yeah, so I think that that just shows you that it's important to to scale your, your variables when it's necessary. Um, okay, so a proportion of the variance explained, right? So to understand the strength of each component, so we're interested in knowing the proportion of the variance that is explained by each one. So the total variance that is present in a data set, um, so assuming again that you know variables have been centered to have mean zero, is defined by this, which is just equivalent to this. And the variance explained by the nth principal component is um, given by this equation. So it can be shown that essentially uh, the variance of the total data set, yes, is equal to the variance given by the first m principal components. Okay, that's very convenient. And so um, 
Therefore, the proportion of the variance explained for the nth principal component is just given by this positive quantity between zero and one. So on top you have, uh, yes, so the variance that is explained by that first, by the m principal components over the total variance of the data set. And um, PV is always summed to one, right? And are sometimes displayed as cumulative PV. So on the left-hand side, you have uh, what is generally called a scree plot or elbow plot. And so you can see, for example, that um, the first principal component explains a little bit over 60% of the variance. And then the second one is a little bit over 20%. So between the first two, you're already getting like 80% of the variance in your data set explained, right? So then um, beyond those, these additional principal components don't do very much. And then on the right-hand side, if you see it plotted by cumulative proportion of the variance. So yeah, so same here at two, right? You're already over 80% of the variance explained in the data set just with, with two principal components. Okay, so so then you know how many principal components should we use, right? Um, so as always, you know there's no simple answer to this question, right? Because you can't use cross validation uh, for these purposes. And they say, why not? Um, so um, it is an unsupervised analysis, right? So we don't have a response variable to check anything against, right? And when could we use cross-validation to select the number of components? So we could use it if we were selecting principal components for principal component regression. I think we saw this method earlier and that is a supervised method, right? So from the book, it says that we can treat the number of principal component score vectors, right? To be used in the regression as a tuning parameter that can be selected via cross-validation or a related approach. Okay, so again, how many principal components should we use? Um, look at your scree or elbow plot and look at the where the elbow is. Um, okay, so from this section on, it just is, is going to jump right into clustering. And I think these slides particularly um, don't describe this matrix completion section, which I thought was very interesting, but it is covered in the lab and in applied exercise 11, right? And so the cool use of this matrix completion is that, for example, a recommender system like Netflix's, like use matrix completion to impute missing values. So for example, right, if you have um, however many, I don't know, 20,000 movies, right? And you have uh, customers rate the ones that you've used, you're gonna get a fairly sparse matrix because you know not every customer is gonna have watched every single movie. But you can use this matrix completion using like principal components in order to sort of hypothesize or impute those missing values. And so this can be a very useful technique. Okay, so now we're going into clustering. So clustering, um, I guess, did you guys have any questions or wanna say anything? I had a quick question. Yeah. I couldn't remember. Why is it called a scree plot? Is it, does it stand for something or? I don't know. Yeah, I, good question. Um, elbow makes sense, but scree, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Just wonder if anyone knew. Okay. Oh, oh it says, uh, it? yeah. Oh, uh, I'm at the same place on Wikipedia. There, yeah, go ahead. yeah. It sounds about, you, know, you go ahead. <laughs> It just says named after the elbow's resemblance to a scree in nature. Uh, oh, it's a, a collection <laughs> of broken rock fragments at the base of a cliff or steep rocky mass oh, that is accumulated okay. through periodic rock fall. So I guess they just kind of like fall off the cliff and then accumulate right. at the bottom and it looks kind of like an elbow, I guess. Like an elbow, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. So that's actually interesting. Apparently it comes from the old Norse for a uh, landslide, scree uh, dot or something like that. <laughs> so your variance like a, is just dropping off. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. Like fairly old reference. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's like a more exciting name. It's better than naming it after a person. No, that's true. That is true. Especially I, now that you um, looked up the what it, it is, I now have this like very vivid picture in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to come up with all kinds of acronyms, but 
I could right. hold it. Okay. Statistical correlation. No, I can't do that. <laughs> Regression. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just throw some words in there. Yeah. Error. <laughs> error. Exponential error. There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, uh, I, uh, yeah, go ahead. I just want, if we don't have major completion later, um, that's the part of this that I'm, I was like most curious about, or I mm -hmm. guess it was the newest. And I had, I had gone ahead to this chapter a while ago, just because uh, I was interested in that matrix completion mm -hmm. method. And I was just going over it. And I've, um, I think it's super interesting. Like the. I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and I'm still trying to grapple with it, but like, I like, mm -hmm. like, I've, I've tried to watch a bunch of different videos on it and the explanation in the book, I think actually makes the most sense um, from how they're, how they're talking about like principal components and loadings and how mm -hmm. that is used to um, uh, impute those missing uh, attributes and that kind of like that, that algorithm that they outlined. Mm -hmm. Like I, I thought that was like really clear for such a complex method i don't know i i, I so anyway i i'm really that was the most exciting part i think to me of the of the chapter and i thought there that algorithm they laid out I, I forget what page it was on but um um yeah i thought they did a really good job with that you know what maybe for next week um since i'm actually very interested in looking over the lab examples um mm -hmm. we could go over the algorithm or maybe like since we're going pretty quickly, maybe we just take a look at the end. Would that be cool? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, it sounds it sounds good. And I, and I think it's also you don't see many situations where the mm -hmm. the the goal or the prediction is that the, like the thing of most interest is in the stuff that's missing. Um, yeah. Like you, yeah. like you don't. It's a very unique kind of context, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But. But I'm also interested to like brainstorm about what it can be used for besides um, like a recommender context. Um, so uh, anyway, so yeah, let's talk, if we have time. We can talk about it. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, okay, so clustering uh, just refers to a very broad set of techniques, right? For finding subgroups or clusters in a data set. So we're looking to partition the data into distinct groups so that the observations within each group are quite similar to each other, right? So to make this concrete, we need to, of course, define what it means for two things to be similar or different. And uh, this is often like a domain specific consideration, right? Um, so you need to just make it based on knowledge or whatever is being used in your field. So um, we can go over, at least for the example of gene expression, like some of the metrics that are used there. So um, PCA versus clustering. So PCA is looking for a low dimensional representation, right, of the observations that explains a good fraction of the variance, right? Whereas clustering is looking for homogeneous subgroups among the observations. Okay, so here's an example uh, for clustering in a market segmentation, right? So say that we have access to a very large number of measurements, like median house income, occupation, distance from nearest urban center, right? For a very large number of people, right? And our goal is to perform market segmentation by identifying subgroups of people who might be more receptive to a particular form of advertising, right? Or just wanting to purchase a specific thing. And so this task of performing market segmentation is essentially clustering the people into the data set into like homogeneous subgroups. So there are uh, two methods that they go over in this chapter. And one is k-means clustering, right? Where they're looking to partition observations into pre-specified numbers of clusters or hierarchical clustering. So we don't know in advance like how many clusters we want or how many we're gonna get. And so in fact, what you end up is uh, with a tree-like visual representation of the observations. And this is called a dendogram. And this allows you to view at once the clusterings obtained for each possible number of clusters. So from one to n. Okay, so first this k-means clustering. So here we have a simulated data set with 150 observations in two dimensional space. And the panels are showing the results of applying k-means clustering with different values of k, right? Um, and I hear the color just indicates which of the two clusters for the value of K uh, specific observation is assigned 
too. And uh, there's no ordering, so the color is just arbitrary. Um, yeah, that seems pretty self-explanatory. Um, so details of the k-means clustering, right? So here you have a C1 through CK are sets containing the indices of the observations in each cluster. And largely they satisfy two properties. So one is um, that each observation belongs to at least one of the clusters and that the clusters are non-overlapping, right? So no observation belongs to more than one cluster. So um, yeah, so for instance, here's a notation. If the i-th observation is in the k-th cluster, then i belongs to this ck. Okay, so here are a little bit more details. So the idea behind k-means clustering is that a good clustering is one for which the within cluster variation is as small as possible. So whatever observations are in a cluster are the most homogeneous grouping. Um, so the within cluster variation for a cluster CK is a measure of this WCV, which is, I think it's the within cluster variation, right? Um, the amount by which the observations within a cluster differ from each other. And we're wanting to solve this problem. We wanna minimize that. Uh, yep. So in words, this formula just says that we want to partition the observations into K clusters such that the total within cluster variation summed over all click clusters is as small as possible. Okay, that makes sense. So generally, uh, we use the Euclidean distance to define the within cluster variation. So given in three, right? And this absolute value of CK denotes the number of observations within the kth cluster. And so if you combine this thing that we want to minimize the within cluster variation with this, um, it gives you the optimization problem that this uh, defines a K-mean clustering, right? So this is what we're minimizing. Okay, so the algorithm goes uh, like this. So you first randomly assign a number from one to K to each of the observations, right? So these are just the initial cluster assignments for each of the observations. And then you iterate until the cluster assignments stop changing. So for each cluster, you compute the cluster centroid and the centroid is the vector of the p feature means for the observations in that cluster. And then um, you assign each observation to the cluster whose centroid is the closest, again, using the Euclidean distance. So this algorithm is guaranteed to decrease the value of the objective for at each step. So what was the objective for? So this, this thing. So why? Um, Okay, so in step 2.1, the cluster means for each feature, right, are the constants that minimize the sum of squared deviations. And in step two, reallocating the observations can only improve this, right? So this means that as the algorithm is run, the clustering obtained will continually improve until the result no longer changes. So in a sense uh, that, whatever this four was. This is just never gonna increase. And I think that the easiest way to see this is um, with the next example that we'll see. So when the result no longer changes and you have reached a local optimum. So again, this is four. This is the thing that we're trying to minimize, right? So it's essentially this, this distance here. And um, as an example, um, you have the data, like all however many uh, observations you have. So in step one, you randomly as assign each of the observations to one of the cluster, right? And now you comp compute the cluster centroid. So it, it makes sense that right here, because everything is random, these are almost overlapping, right? And then um, for the next iteration, now using those centroids, you compute the distance uh, from each of the observations to the centroid and assign the observations to the centroid that is closest, right? And so here, what you see then is by just iterating this, observations are, in a sense, you're never going to increase the distance within cluster um, going in this stepwise fashion is, is what I get out of it. So um, 
the square distance in a sense between each observation, xij in a cluster, in the clustered centroid is always becoming smaller. There, I don't see like a way that it becomes larger uh, using this these steps. And um, I guess my question was if you guys have, I think I get it, but why is this referred to as a local minimum and not a global minimum? If you're looking between clusters as well. Or is, is it that you're just optimizing within each cluster after, you know, like this random is random step? Well, I mean, basically it, the book explains that if you uh, start this at different initial steps, you'll come up with a different set of groupings and each one of those oh. groupings that comes up with is a, is a different local minimum in the whole landscape of possible oh. solutions. So it just falls into a little valley where that quantity is minimized. Uh, with uh -huh. these particular groupings, but that's not the only grouping that would do it. There's other groupings that would, you'd have to climb up out of that hill to get into other valleys where that is. And so that's why they recommend starting with several different random initial starting points, and uh -huh. then it will, random initial assignments, and then it will find multiple minimum, and you take the, you take the smallest of those, hoping that you've gotten something that's close to the global anyway. Right, okay. Maybe you can okay. just look at that, that it into the camera, but... Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is essentially just the details of the previous figure. And then, yeah, this is what Ron just mentioned that, um, and you just explained in a sense why it's a local rather than a global optimum, right? And okay, so I, I, think, I, I think I was just getting confused with, you know, local meaning, you know, observations within like a cluster versus all of the observations, but I think that that's not, the correct interpretation. So, um, so yes. So then, it is important to run the algorithm multiple times from different random initial con configurations, and then you can just select the best solution. So, for example, in this one, um, starting from random points, these one, two, three, four, uh, obtain like the smallest value um, from different. This is the, and that is that the within cluster, uh, like. Um, distance from the centroid? I think like, this is like the, the average. That for the objective, so the numbers in red is smallest, and I believe the objective is this. The square distance between the centroid and the, each observation? Or no, yeah, all or, points. Or this thing all that you're minimizing. I think it might be actually, yeah. Is that all points, all pairs of points in the cluster? Uh, I think so over all the clusters, right? So, so this one, okay, so. I, I believe it's the distance for clusters. each point from its own cluster's center. Right. Oh, right. it's from the center, okay. I believe, and then. Um, summing yeah. over all of the. Then summing cluster. over all the clusters and averaging, yeah. I guess. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, somewhere I thought there was a part of this where it was like all the pairs. Um, but yeah, that's my mom, something my mom, else, right? Yeah, I need to look back. At it. Yeah, what was that? You're right. There was something about all the pairs. Oh, that's for that. That's for that. Um, that tree thingy, whatever that's called, the hierarchical thing. Oh, okay. okay. You, yeah, coming up. Coming, coming up. Soon. up. Yeah. <laughs> Solution of the objective, yeah, which is given in four, so that minimization, yeah. Okay, so hierarchical clustering. So k-means clustering requires us to pre-specify the number of clusters k, right? Um, so this can be a disadvantage, because um, how do you know that you know the substructure in the data has whatever cluster, number of clusters you're specifying? So hierarchical clustering is an alternative approach, which does not require that we commit to a particular choice of K, okay? So um, this section only covers bottom-up or agglomerative clustering. So it's the most common type of hierarchical clustering, and it refers to the fact that the dendogram is built starting from the leaves, right? And then fusing clusters up the trunk. Okay, so this is the idea, right? Uh, so you have uh, these observations, and so you combine the ones that are closest based on some similarity measure like this, like that, and then finally like that, right? Okay, so 
the approach in words is you start with each point in its own cluster, identify the closest two clusters and you merge them, you repeat, and then you end when all points are in one single cluster. Um, okay, that makes sense. Uh, okay, so here we have an example. So we have 45 observations generated in two dimensional space, right? And, Reality, there are three distinct classes that's shown in different colors, but um, we will treat the class labels as unknown and we're just gonna seek to cluster the observations in order to discover the classes from the data. Okay, so um, what they did is used, sorry, let me see first. Yeah, so okay, so these are different examples of uh, dendrograms that you can obtain using different types of like, linkages, I think, in different um, distances or similarity metrics, right? Um, just an important thing that uh, was sort of covered in the chapter is that the height of the dendrogram, right, on the y-axis is the distance or dissimilarity between clusters, right? So clusters that fuse early on, like for example, like these two rightmost on the left panel, right? Are the most similar because you know these tiny little branches are smallest so on the y axis direction um, so don't use the horizontal distance so just because these two are close or or say that you had something that is fusing up here right but the two branches are close together on the horizontal axis that doesn't mean that they're similar so just look at the at the height um, Okay, so on the left, there was an, a dendrogram that was obtained from hierarchically clustering the data with complete linkage in the Euclidean distance, right? So this, and then um, I think these two panels are just showing you how you can cut dendrograms at a specific height, and then it just results in different numbers of clusters. Um, so for example, if you cut it here, you got one and two, and then if you cut it at this other height, that's one, two, three clusters. And the colors are just there for showing that they're different clusters. Um, so just for display purposes. So the types of linkage um, are listed here, right? And so the complete linkage is essentially the maximal intercluster dissimilarity, right? So you compute, this is maybe what you were talking about, Kevin. So compute all pairwise dissimilarities between the observations in cluster A and B, and then you just take the largest of the dissimilarities. Um, single linkage is similar, but you're looking at the smallest of the dissimilarities, and then the average is just, you know, um, you compute like the same thing, but you're taking the average of the dissimilarities. And then there's also centroid. So the similarity between the centroid for cluster A, which is just a mean vector of length P, okay, and the cluster for centroid cluster for B. Um, the ones that I've used mostly or I've seen used as complete and average linkage. I have not seen single linkage used as much. Um, go on to the next slide. And then how do you choose, right, this dissimilarity measure? So the similarity or essentially similarity. So, so far we have used the Euclidean distance, right? But you can also use the correlation-based distance, which considers like two observations to be similar, right? If their features are highly correlated. So they say, you know, this is an unusual use of correlation, which is normally computed between variables, right? But here it is computed between the observation profiles for each pair of observations. So for example, like, um, you have, I guess, variable index means, I guess these are the features, right? So 20 features. So if you look at observation one and two, sorry, one and three, so in orange and pink, you can see that those are close, would be close in the Euclidean distance between them and just the, the values on the y-axis, right? But they're not necessarily correlated versus like observation two and one, so the orange and green. So the values here are very different. So this is one's around, you know, this range between five and 15 and the other one is in the range of zero to five, but they're correlated in that they follow this similar pattern over the features, right? And so you can also use this correlation to do your hierarchical clustering. 
Um, it is very, that is very odd. I, 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 yeah, it's really weird. Uh, yeah, you know, so um, normally for gene expression, right? So you have, for example, um, imagine like a heat map, right? Um, mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll show you later because I do have some examples of heat maps and um, the preferred thing is used to be the Euclidean distance, but now people are using correlation like the Pearson to actually mm. produce these heat maps. Yeah, but just keep in mind that, you know, a lot of this is just like exploratory and it's sort of like a, sometimes it's whichever display looks better or shows, you know, the trend that you're maybe that makes more sense that explains more things. And that might be why you pick it, but then you have to validate this in some other way, regardless, right? So this is just almost like saying, um, oh, this looks like an interesting trend, but then you got to check it some some other way. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, so, almost, it's, mm -hmm. it's almost like you're transposing like a data frame to like, or a table to like do a correlate. I don't know. Yeah, I'm just trying to grapple with it. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, no problem. I think you might be on to the, the right thing, though, because, um, yeah, okay. So for some practical issues, right? So again, scaling of the variables matters, right? So should you sort of standardize your features in some way, right? So for example, like, uh, should you z-score so that you have everything to mean zero and scale to like a standard deviation of one? Because um, remember, like, um, otherwise you're going to get the things that just may not make sense in terms of like the contribution of each of the features, right, to whatever you're you're clustering or grouping by. So, um, and then also, you know, in the case of hierarchical clustering, like what the similarity measure do you use and what type of linkage, right? And then also like how many clusters to choose, like in both k-means or hierarchical clustering when you're cutting like the dendrograms. So it's just a difficult program. There's no agreed upon method, right? Um, you can see this, the ESL chapter 13 for more details if you're interested. And then which features should you use to drive the clustering? So, okay. So here's an example of a breast cancer microarray study. So this is just gene expression again. So you have repeated observation of breast tumor subtypes in independent gene expression data sets. And this is the reference. So um, they had gene expression measurements for about 8,000 genes for each of 88 breast cancer patients, right? They use average linkage and a correlation metric, and uh, they clustered the samples using 500 intrinsic genes. So each woman was measured before and after chemotherapy, and these intrinsic genes have the smallest within and between variation. Uh, why would you use that, let me think. So, Oh, okay. I'll think about that. Okay, so these are the results in a sense of the of the clustering, and you can see that um, it actually does a fairly good job of grouping by the subtype of of cancer, right? And then this also gives you an idea as to what things or which subtypes may be more similar, um, and which are different. Like for example, these that cluster together over here are more similar in their gene expression than this luminal subtype A, right? Um, so again, so in this specific clustering, they use average linkers and then the correlation metric. And I think so you have patients, right, on columns and then genes here in rows as is, as is typically shown. And I think that for um, the reason why the correlation metric is useful is that it can tell you, um, so not just which genes have similar like expression, but actually how the expression may change similar to other genes. You, you know what I'm saying? So not just in like the, the total, um, say like absolute value of how much is it expressed, but how correlated it is to other genes. And I think that that, especially in gene expression, can tell you whether those genes are regulated by the same regulatory network. And so that can give you like an additional layer of information. Um, so I think that at the moment, like I've seen correlation distance being used more often now, maybe it makes like for a prettier heat map like this, you know, and or for example, you could just take like uh, the subtype of cancer, like 
code that has been you know clustered by the type of gene expression and then for example in this uh, e right like all of these that seem to be overexpressed in this basal subtype you could run those through a program and see if they actually coordinate the work in some specific module that may be regulated by like a specific for example like network or a transcription factor. And so that, that actually would be cool because then that just gives you information beyond just like how much each of the genes is expressed. Although how much each of the genes is expressed can, can also give you some other type of information. Um, okay, so then I also wanted to point out a very important uh, thing about heat maps. So this red green is a Stanford type heat map because of the colors. Whereas UC Berkeley <laughs> uses the nicer yellow blue, go bears. And so I just wanna say just, you know, be judicious in how you choose your colors for heat maps. So there's a little bit of that Stanford Berkeley rivalry. Um, and I think uh, it's actually, I think it's actually a Christmas heat map, but yeah. Oh, I see, because you know, Stanford colors are the red green. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think and they do have a Christmas tree as their, as they have the right? tree as their thing, right? And also, I think that this paper, sorely at out PNAS, is a Stanford paper. And I guess Tip Sharani, it's one of the authors, is a Stanford guy. So when I've seen, um, at least in my old lab, we always use the, the blue gold, so California colors. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, <laughs> just so you know. Um, okay, and then they also use, you know, their clustering by subtype then to predict overall survival, which we did last chapter by, by subtype. And I mean, you that's, can tell that it's different too, right? So I think that here, cool. your gene expression, yeah, it's, it's actually, or the clustering is giving you some meaningful information as to subtype that then correlates with this like survival phenotype. Um, okay, so conclusions, um, unsupervised learning is important for understanding the variation and grouping structure, right, of a set of unlabeled data. And uh, it can be a useful preprocessor for supervised learning. Um, that makes sense. Um, it is intrinsically more difficult than supervised learning because there is no gold standard, like an outcome variable, and also no single objective, like you know the test set accuracy that you could actually measure. So it is an active field of research with many recently developed tools, um, such as self-organizing maps, independent component analysis, and spectral clustering. Um, yeah, okay, so that's the last that I have for this part. Um, I'm gonna switch over to the book and let me see if I can find the, can you see the, the PDF of the book now? Yes. Okay, so let me look for the section on matrix. Sorry for all my highlighting. Sometimes I, it's not that I'm highlighting important things. It's just like, as I go along, to keep myself entertained and engaged, I highlight things. Okay, so missing values and matrix completion, right? So, Kevin, did you want to maybe talk a little bit oh, about this, I, like since you looked it up? I just uh, it would be, I thought it'd be good to talk through that the algorithm. The algorithm, box, yeah. Okay. So this one right, right here, yeah. Yeah. I mean, to start with, like that Netflix competition, I was reading a little more about it, um, mm -hmm. and that data set was 99.9% .9 missing. Oh, wow. So, okay. So that's the kind of situation. It's like something like, I don't know, uh, I, I forget how many, like millions of, of rows, 99.9% uh, .9 missing. And I just, for a second, wanted to marvel like how different of a problem that is than anything yeah. we've seen in this book. Um, mm -hmm. And, but also it's interesting because like, uh, so also the other place I've seen matrix completion discussed is in the um, causal inference world. So like, um, mm -hmm. like there, if you treat basically, you know, uh, you can only observe a person's outcome in one condition, either like if you're thinking about like a treatment or control, for instance, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. um, but you could see it as kind of a missing data problem and use matrix completion um, to uh, try to impute what their outcome would have been had they not been treated or had they been treated. Um, so anyway, it's being used a lot there now, um, or it's like, a, that's a new application of it. And yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think it's super cool. Um, but, but I thought like this, 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 
these steps here were interesting because of the tight connection with how they were talking about PCA. Um, and when I watch all these other videos, they're talking about like low rank and all this stuff and uh, singular value decomposition. And um, I need to review my linear algebra because I, I don't remember a lot of that, that stuff. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, I just thought this is a really interesting view of like how this works. Um, so, so yeah, so I think they just start off by saying like, anything that's missing, you just make as the mean of that variable to start. Um, and then you essentially compute the principal components. And I think this is where I got confused when I initially looked at this. I think A is like the components and B is the, oops. No screen, thank you. Uh, I guess I went out. Oh, she dropped on us. Gonna yeah. wait till she gets reconnected. Yeah, yeah. Um. Sorry, guys. Sandra? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I am back. Sorry, got disconnected. Kevin, maybe do you want to share um, so that in case I get disconnected, then you guys at least can still see the the book. I'm doing page. this from my iPad right now, um, so oh, okay. I could find it, but it might be a little harder. If you still have it, it'd be yeah, I have it. Uh, I don't mind. It. I don't mind if yeah. yeah if you're, okay. If you drop. Sorry it. about that. Hopefully, I will uh, get disconnected. So, um, yeah. So like, uh, so they're saying like basically you start by imputing the mean so you just start with the mean for these missing values um and mm -hmm. then and then i think you compute these principal components and i think like a and b are like the um i think it's the, the component and the, the loading for each, mm -hmm. end, for each component um and so you're you know minimizing this distance i guess between x i j and um and um uh, and uh like the components in their loading, right? Like the square distance. Mm -hmm. Um and then see, for each element. So then you and then you use those components you've created um in their loadings to actually estimate the missing uh observation. So I think and this is just using the principal components. So going through each of them and doing a sum um, for that i for each component times its loading, mm -hmm. um, and then and then you um, yeah, so you can keep the um, and I guess you're recomputing. I, I don't know. I don't get this last c step here. Um, Objective. And then are you recomputing the uh -huh. principal components with this repeated value again? Can you do that iteratively until a certain point? Um, or yeah, I don't, I guess that's so these last two. I'm kind of <laughs> oh, oh, wait. No, never mind. Okay. But yeah, so I don't you get know. These, you get these XIJ like kind of estimates from the components and their loadings. Um, yeah. And then, and then you just compute like how close that is. Oh, I guess for everything that's not missing. So C is everything that it's the IJs that are in the, the complete set, mm -hmm. the ones that are complete. And so each of those IJ observations, you're just looking at the same thing in the square distance. Uh, so what you I can't from hear from you, Kevin. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'm just kind of mumbling. Um, no, no. Can you hear me okay, yeah. Now, I can better? hear you now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I don't quite get what the. What you're doing in C there. Do you have these estimated? Yeah, this estimate here. Um, computing, I guess you're just computing like how accurate this, um, like how accurate, the, the, like how closely you can get to the observed value using those components to see if it is 
continuing to decrease, I guess, because then you're going to repeat A, B, and C until you get something that like decrease. And then, and then, um, mm. right? And then, and then, like, uh, so like the next time around, you're recomputing the principal components based with with those imputed ij's that were missing before that you imputed with the principal components in the first step you're going to use those i guess as observations in the next round you keep doing that until it doesn't decrease something like that um that's how i interpret it yeah it looks like you know you start out with a guess that they're the means and then compute the principal components and then you're going to use the first m principal components because that's the whole idea right you're going to right down it, I guess. Um, so then you. That's continue. the. So now you're getting an approximation. Like yeah. And that, that's like the low rank idea, right? Yeah. The yeah. first M. And how are you? How are you getting to those first M? How do you know how many M components you want to? Oh, is it, is it up in still? Oh, sorry. Now go ahead. Uh, I don't know how you choose M. I mean, I think it talks a little bit about that in the book, but it seemed like it was one of oh. those. Art, art things, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, they did mention cross-validation, I think. They say, uh, but I, I think, but, but I don't know if that's to choose M or just to uh, validate the performance of the imputation, but you can like, you can uh, make make observations that are present, missing at random, and then uh, assess the performance. Um, but, yeah, it looks like the soft I'll impute. Yeah. yeah. The R library Sorry. soft impute does this for you. Um, and it's especially designed to deal with those big sparse matrices. And it, it looks like it uses the default value of M equals two. So I don't know. That must not be very big <laughs> uh, requirements. So, Maybe it's, yeah. it could be one of those things in this stuff where it's like, you know the 70 30 rule of test and train that's right yeah you know, it's like yeah. it's like it's like yeah you know people have like thought that that sounds like a really nice number so um but i, I bet I you really could know, do it in like yeah. a cross-validated cross-validated way like do it a bunch like with different num m's and see what those like on those kind of quote unquote hold out observations that you know the true value of um oh they do mention something like that you're right yeah yeah, but so I watched a video actually um, where someone was talking about like an adaptation of this. And one of the interesting things I got out of it was that this is very sensitive to the kind of missingness you have. So like if if it's missing sure. at random, yeah. if it's missing at random, this like that, um, what's the soft impute uh, function uh, algorithm that uh, Trevor, is it Trevor Hasty developed, right? Or, one of them, right? One of the authors mm -hmm. developed it. Yeah, Trevor, Trevor um, Hasty, that's right. Yeah, and, and so like it performs really, really well um, when you have that case. But when you start to have bias in the missingness, uh, it it really struggles. Um, so you, you have to be careful about like, like uh, no understanding why the data is missing and then to, before applying before applying that kind of this kind of approach. But um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that does. I mean, I could think of some cases where the missingness itself is, a, is an interesting data point. So you may want to actually make an indicator variable just based on that instead, right? Yeah. So, oh, this is missing. It's actually a predictor of something. The fact that it's missing means something, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, like, like they could be your lowest performers of the study or something, or yeah. like they, they didn't, you know, they, or, or I don't know, like this, there's some, I don't know, whatever, uh, some, some uh, yeah, some consistent pattern to why they're why they're not there. But um, yeah, I just I just like I, I think it's so cool. Like I don't know why I'm just obsessed with this idea. But um, uh, yeah, it's, it's really I'm just neat. wondering. Um, okay, so you said that these matrices are like ninety nine percent missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I, I'm just like surprise it with one percent right of data actually there you can actually do this like i mean i, I understand tenth of one percent yeah right oh i see yeah i mean it's it's like you yeah. know you have again you have that's crazy you have enough 
I guess you have enough observations where you mm -hmm. can kind of you mm -hmm. can kind of see like like someone has a piece of it, another person has a slightly overlapping piece. Like as long as there's I think as long as there's enough overlap, like you can kind of chain together a bunch of overlaps. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Then, then you kind of can, I don't know. Uh, but if, if they're totally non-overlapping, you know, like then I don't think this helps you. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Like you have 50,000 observations where they have the first three variables, but not the last three. And those mm -hmm. are the resting. And then you have 50,000 other observations with the opposite. Like, I don't think this would really help you. Uh, yeah. You yeah, yeah, see, yeah, yeah. You never see the combination or the hybrid of those two missingness cases. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Another question that I have was yeah. this is like Kevin, I thought this was one of the more interesting parts only because I think it might be useful to me more likely and the rest of it more likely mm -hmm. to be useful it's dealing with missing <laughs> values is, i knew, that, um, I knew I would, that both of you would like that part <laughs> <laughs> does anyone know how this compares i mean maybe you know kevin does this i know you could also use like regression to impute values right just like treating that particular column as if it was the the uh, outcome um the response yeah. variable and then just like using regression does that that's, I mean, I think it's, that's it's a different thing, of, right? It's not like two sides of the same. I don't know. I think it's similar. Um, in the in that one of the videos I saw, it was actually it was actually Hasty and Tib Sharani talking. I think they're both at Stanford, and it was like a Stanford video. Um, and they actually did compare it to. They're like, it's like oh. using linear regression to impute, like to predict the missing values yeah. based on all all the other columns. But like, I guess it makes sense because like these are like, it's using principal components, right? And like, principal components are the linear combination of yeah. all columns that maximize variance. I don't know. I don't know exactly the connection, but um, but they did bring it up in that video about matrix completion. So um, maybe there's some like deep connection there that they didn't want to go into, but. Um, um, yeah, it does seem like a similar idea. So, um, in the in the in the video I saw where they were talking about um, like uh, like an improvement for these cases where there's bias in the missingness, um, they were doing something um, that was like a nearest neighbors approach. So they basically said like like if you have two cases where like person one has similar ratings on movie one and two at, compared to person two, but then a movie three person person one has a rating of four stars and person two has no is missing, then if that's like the closest match in terms of their ratings and the observed values, then just give them, just give them that, that value or an average of like their closest neighbors or whatever. Um, uh, so that's yeah. like another, another approach. Um, and you can actually, that's, I think that's actually something you can do in um, tidy models. Like I think there's a nearest neighbors um, and also regression, I think, uh, missing this, like an imp impute. I have a question, Kevin. Yeah. Sorry. Um, um, so um, what about like the issue of, uh, you know, under sampling, if we have data set that is, you know, not well balanced, can we use this idea like to upsample those, the classes that is not well balanced? For the data set, yeah, you mean make it complete. Hello. Hello. Yep. Yeah, yes. 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 Uh, do you mean make it complete? Yes. I mean, uh, I I I don't think it would be useful because I just. Didn't, I don't know, but maybe others have other opinions. Like um, in that case, you don't have missing this. You just have um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you just you just have uh, underrepresentation. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I think like yeah. This is I think in my mind it's mostly about cases where you have like these partial 
incomplete data sets and you have some overlap and how they're incomplete across observations and mm. um okay. kind of guess what those two values would be if they had been measured. Um but mm. one I mean one thing I think in the Netflix example that I was thinking about was like about the missingness at random thing. Like part of it is probably random. Like if I watch a movie from one genre and I would really like a, a similar movie from that genre, like, like just based on other people who have watched both of those movies. Um, like, you know, maybe it's just random that I hadn't found that movie. Um, but like, hmm. I don't I, like maybe on average it's random. But uh, I can just I was thinking I bet there are reasons why that are not random. Um, that like you would stumble upon a certain set of movies. Um, you know, in, in the genre and not others, like, you know, like, like, I don't know, maybe you like hate a certain actor, like, you know, like you just, you're like, you're, I'm never going to watch that movie, even though it is similar in like its content, I'm never going to watch that movie, like, um, and you're just like biased against all movies with that actor, like, that's not going to be a principal component, you know, it's going to be like, like in this, in this, in this technique, like, you're just going to get these like broad, like, like components for across the whole data set and I don't know um I mean maybe that stuff just washes out and it doesn't really matter but um yeah yeah I don't know I mean I think maybe that's where like a nearest neighbors type of thing would get closer in that kind of case because like it would maybe uh, it, would, it would match me to someone else who watches every movie with with with, with Tom Cruise or something you know, and it, it's not about like how those vary together on average. It's like how it's like, you know, just like how close am I to someone else who has similar uh, taste? Um, yeah, weren't they talking about something like called like clicks and genres? Um, let me scroll up. Was that under yeah. the PCA part? I think, uh, Hold on. I think it was under the matrix completion potentially. Okay, okay. I think like because I think like the principal component. Uh, I think uh, they're saying columns or like movies, and so like the components that you get out of get out of that process are like genres because they're mm -hmm. kind of like a summary across a bunch of movies of like that captures the most variance, and then and maybe like yeah I don't know clicks somehow map onto rows like each person who are similar to each other but i'm not sure so. oh yeah here we go hey i guess we uh, reached the uh end of our time okay um, and at least for me i i need to take off uh are you, what's the plan for next week are you gonna continue on with some of this or the lab or yeah, I would like to go over the lab because this is be actually good, fairly useful for me in terms of like just like the PCA part and clustering. Yeah, let's, do let's do it then. Um, maybe okay. I'll focus on matrix completion and see if I can yeah. get some, some analysis out there on that. Yeah. Bring in tasty. Give me more time to do some of the exercises. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that sounds and, good. Uh, awesome. All right, I gotta take right. off. I will catch okay. you guys next time. All righty. Bye bye. See and you. Thanks. Thanks. No so much. Good job.